Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guest is Norman Weimer, Executive Director of the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Thanks for joining us, Norm, and a reminder to our webcast guests that you can ask questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show. Uh, there will also be some polls that pop up, and, and please fill them out. It'll be very interesting to hear your response. Norm. Thanks for inviting me. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here to talk about justice and to talk about the work of NACDL, a professional association of lawyers who defend people accused of crime. And in addition to serving members, you focus intensely on improving the justice system and safeguarding fundamental constitutional rights. So let's just sort of do some, some state setting. Let's talk about the organization, its scope, its members, and then let's get into some, some of the issues that you advocate for. Well, we are, as you said, we are, we are a bar association. We are the Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, criminal defense lawyers from all realms of the profession, public defenders, private attorneys, military defense counsel, people in small, solo, and large firms. Uh, and you know, we are, I like to say, a sort of an atypical trade association uh, because our primary mission is to promote a fairer and more rational and humane criminal justice system uh, we have as an institutional miss mission to try to root out systemic racism uh, and, and deal with disparity throughout uh, the, the uh, criminal justice system. And um, for that reason, we're not there primarily to, to advocate for the, for the economic self-interest of criminal defense lawyers, but rather uh, to, to advocate uh, for uh, these higher, loftier goals. Um, I would also say that uh, what what the folks who are members of this organization do in their daily life is uh, they discharge a fundamental constitutionally ordained function. Uh, criminal defense lawyers are one of the few occupations that are mentioned in the Bill of Rights. And um, it's really important to understand that the way the criminal defense lawyer uh, views their work is that it's not just about representing the individual or representing a particular uh, entity that's accused of a crime. It's about a, a much, much more important principle, and that is uh, the principle of human dignity. And you know, what I would point out to those who haven't looked at it lately, uh, the Sixth Amendment provides that all persons are entitled uh, to a defense attorney when they're accused by the government. And it's significant that it says all persons. It doesn't say just the innocent. It doesn't say the maybe innocent. It says all persons because even someone who has done something wrong, who is guilty, deserves to have someone stand with them when the full might of the government is brought against them. And that is the role of the defense lawyer. It is about preserving the dignity of the individual under all circumstances. It's fighting for the principle that power should not just sit on one side of these kinds of questions of justice, that the debate should, should happen on a level playing field. And you keep through that tension, you keep both sides honest. You get to question any element of evidence, any element of process um, in a way that is equal, that can be equally aggressive on each side. Well, you're right up to a point, Mark. The idea is uh, to have a, a check on government, not just the checks and balances between the branches, but the check between the government and the individual. And that's what the defense lawyer is for. But sadly, it is, it is hardly a level playing field. It's, it's not a level playing field in this country because in many respects, uh, the criminal justice system is anything but just. In fact, a lot of people now don't like to use that term. They call it the criminal legal system because there is such a lack of justice. Um, the fact of the matter is that when you have all the resources of the government and all of the tools that are at the disposal of unchecked prosecutors and, and simply one defense lawyer, uh, it's not really a fair fight. Uh, beyond that is the economic reality that most people in this country depend upon appointed counsel, either a public defender or a private lawyer who gets appointed by the court. Most people, maybe not you or me, but most people in this country cannot afford to mount a defense. And uh, so there are so many different pressure points uh, at which the system doesn't live up to its ideal. But the ideal and what, uh, what individuals sign up for when they 
embark on a career as a criminal defense lawyer is truly a noble, noble calling, which is the, the hallmark of a true democracy. And I'll just say one more thing. We, our, our, the founding people of this country uh, messed up a lot of things, and we're still living with their mistakes every day. And some communities are not just living with it, they're, 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 they're oppressed by it. But the concept of the right to counsel uh, is a noble concept that has trend, you know, been transmitted all over the world. And it is something that we should be proud of and we should protect at all times. In terms of these imbalances, you made reference to the fact that uh, there are imbalances based in, in economics. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the, the measure of justice that different people, different groups um, achieve when it comes to uh, their own wealth, uh, uh, racial disparities, other kinds of disparities that seem to be embedded in the results of our justice system, where we see incarceration rates far higher for people with, with less money, uh, people of certain ethnic groups, of certain races. Um, how, does, how does this uh, play out? Do we have a justice system that is equal for all? And how do we make it more perfect in, in its, in its uh, imperfection today? Let me start by saying the, the first and most obvious thing. The, the moment anybody goes into criminal defense, the first thing you see when you walk into courtrooms all over the country or in the holding cells all over the country is the incredible disparity, the incredible disproportionate impact of how we are policed and prosecuted in this country. Uh, you mentioned our, you know, our mass incarceration, high incarceration. The United States imprisons more people in actual numbers and per capita than any other country in the world. So one might ask, well, are we a nation of criminals? The answer is no. We are not a nation of fundamentally criminal people. What we are is a nation that is over-prosecuted, over-policed, and over-incarcerated. We have decided as a society that it's okay to use the criminal law to address all manner of social, personal, and economic behavior that is disfavored. And that is why we have so many people in prison. Now, on top of that is a, a, an approach to law enforcement which treats different people differently. You know, all the statistics show uh, that marijuana use is at, at least as high among white people as it is among people of color. But if you look at the statistics of who has been prosecuted and who has been jailed over the years, and this is with all, you know, all drugs, you will see that disparate impact. You will see it in the communities. Uh, if you're driving in certain neighborhoods and you have a crack in your windshield, you might have an officer pull you over and say, you know, you really need to get that fixed. Or maybe on a bad day, you'll actually get a summons for it. But if you're in a different neighborhood, you will be yanked out of the car, put face down on the ground, you will be searched, your car will be searched. That's what we're dealing with in this country. And that's why uh, what's going on in the country right now uh, is, a, is a moment of opportunity. Because for once, the entire country seems to have awakened to the fact that this criminal legal system is broken and it's not working fairly for all people. And it's high time that we fix it. Now, you ask me, how do we fix it? There are so many different points at which we have to address uh, the flaws in the system. Um, and I, I can't single out any one of them, but I can tell you that the first step, the first step toward reform, and we have, we have reached that first step, Mark, the first step is recognizing it. And now more than ever, people recognize it. When they saw that video of what happened to George Floyd, they saw something that was staggering in brutality and callousness. But what they also need to know is that there are George Floyd episodes happening every day, not on that level, not people getting killed or having their, you know, the life crushed out of them, but the way in which people are treated is different for people of color. And that is a fact. They are arrested differently. They are, they are charged differently. They are sentenced differently. And that's why when you look at our jails, the percentage of people of color far exceeds the percentage of people of color in the population. Well, it seems that, that one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to manage the downstream um, uh, impacts of other injustices that are embedded into our system using the justice system. 
In other words, poverty creates response. Um, uh, racism creates response. There are issues that, that then uh, emerge, and then the justice system seems to be used to control that response, to put a lid on it, to uh, somehow um, uh, intercede before a perceived problem can happen. We've heard that story so often, and, it's, and the perception is all uh, focused on how somebody looks or somebody's, some law enforcement person's uh, preconceptions, right? But, but there's also some reality here. There's also the reality that people are breaking laws and hurting other people, right? So there are these two issues. One is there's a, there's a totally valid thing in terms of public safety and then the repercussions in the court system. And then there's, a, there's another piece, which is really about um, managing society's inability to deal proactively with its, with its inequality problems. Um, and and you cannot you cannot fix something you didn't do by taking a hammer to uh, the downstream effects. Right. So what's what I think has happened in this country is that rather than deal with underlying problems in an in an, in an integrated, thoughtful, uh, all you know all embracing way, we simply pass laws and make it a crime. That's how we think we're going to get rid of problems. If if there's if, there, if, if we have uh, people who are abusing substances, uh, we'll just make it illegal. Uh, but that doesn't solve the underlying problem. In fact, it exacerbates it. It, it ends up uh, destroying families and communities. Uh, and you can go down a whole litany of things where rather than address things like uh, the problem of mental health issues, um, we, don't, we don't deal with that in, a, in an intelligent way. We, 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 send, we send a police officer you know, armed to the teeth to deal with somebody who's having a mental health crisis. That's not, that's not sensible. It leads to problems. It doesn't solve problems. And it's very- And no possible. officer wants to do that, actually. No officer wants to deal with a domestic uh, uh, dispute. You know, when you talk with, with officers, uh, those are the last issues they want to be dealing with in any event. We just right. took a poll right. um, and we have, um, uh, the vast majority of people think that there is some real change that is needed. Uh, 24, uh, 27% believe that, that um, uh, some significant change is needed, but, but, the, uh, but the system is basically sound. And 64% uh, believe that uh, fundamental change is needed. Uh, let's move on to, to the topic uh, that is near and dear to your heart, and that's the whole idea of, of trial penalty. And I, and I experienced the, the trial penalty concept personally in a very small way, um, uh, received a traffic ticket. Um, it was very clear to me that if I contested the ticket and I showed up at court, my penalty would be, would be larger. I felt strongly about it, so I did. My penalty was stronger, was larger, but it wasn't a big deal to me. But there's this aspect that everybody experiences in a traffic ticket that really takes on a completely different uh, meaning, a much more serious meaning in other situations. Could you describe uh, the, the, this whole situation and how it uh, affects justice. Yeah, well, the, what we call the trial penalty is probably uh, one of the most pervasive uh, problems in the system. And until we confront that, we will, we will not be able to fix the justice system. Um, what the trial penalty is, is a panoply of uh, factors, laws, practices, policies, that enable prosecutors to penalize people for exercising fundamental rights. And so what you talk about in the traffic ticket is really, you know, you know it's a good example in a, in a very simple way. If you, if you mail in your, your check for a certain amount, that's what it is. If you go and you go to court and fight it, it will be a lot greater. And that happens every day in every criminal court in the states, in the federal system, in this country. It has become the norm. The norm is you pile on the farther somebody goes in asserting their innocence in order to induce them to plead guilty. And those who dare to go to trial or those who have to go to trial uh, un ultimately will suffer the greatest penalty. And, uh, you know, we've done a study on it. Um, in New York State, our affiliate is doing a study right now. We have a, we have a movie that we have, that NACDL has co-produced with BAM. Uh, called The Vanishing Trial, which profiles people 
uh, who have suffered the consequences of the trial penalty. And, and Mark, it's, it's, it's not just that you get a geometrically greater sentence if you exercise a fundamental right, it's that you are induced to give up those rights right from the very beginning. And it not only to... makes sense if there's a presumption of guilt as opposed to a presumption of innocence, right? What there, it... what there is, you're, you're, you're right, and, and it's turned the presumption of innocence on its head. What there is, is a presumption of expediency. Everybody, the, the courts want to move their dockets. The prosecutors want to, don't want to have to spend the time and money trying cases. They don't want to run the risk of losing it, of losing those cases. And so right from the very beginning, if you're, if you're charged with a crime, you may, there are places in this country where if, if you don't take a plea, you won't get out of jail. You will sit in jail if you don't take a plea right at the beginning. Um, at every stage of the case, they will say to you, if you do this, if you take, if you file your motions, the offer will go up. Uh, and, and so the consequences, there are, there are a multitude of consequences. Um, and by the way, all of them, all of these consequences are magnified for poor people and people of color, because they're the ones who are less able to mount the resources. Uh, my example of not being able to afford bail. Well, if you're, a, if you're a person of means and you can post the bail, at least you can be free and then make your decision. But if not, if the choice is, well, I'll get my day in court, uh, but I'll have to wait six months or a year, and I might be in jail, I might lose my children, I will lose my job, I will lose my home. Um, the, other, the other systemic problem with the trial penalty, and, and this is a really, really important point, is we rely on the criminal courts to adjudicate law enforcement behavior. If the police engage in an illegal stop, for example, they, they just simply target somebody because of their race or because they don't like the way they look at them. That should be challenged in a court of law. But when you have a system which says, well, if you bring that motion to suppress, A, we won't make the, the initial offer to you, and B, if you lose, we'll say you lied and we'll enhance your sentence on the back end. So what you have is you have the system protecting itself by getting people to give up their right to have a court hear what happened. And so you're, you're constraining the law and you're allowing misconduct to go forward without a check on it. Um, some of the worst examples are the fact that sometimes the least culpable people in a case will get the greatest sentence because they will be the ones who maybe they actually were innocent. And so they will go to trial. Um, and then what you have is these enhancements, which the prosecutors have at their disposal where they say, well, if, you know, at the, on the eve of trial, and we've seen this documented, if you go to trial, we're going to file this enhancement or that enhancement. And so the reality is that the pressure to plead guilty and give up rights is so great that a rational, innocent person will do so. And how do we know that? We can look at the statistics uh, from the Innocence Project and the National Registry of Exonerations between 11 and 15% of people who have actually been exonerated, they were actually not guilty, pled guilty to avoid the trial penalty. Well, it's a, rational, it's, it's a rational decision given the percentages, right? People are basically gambling with their lives and at a certain point they're being encouraged to take a bet that because of their awareness that the system is tilted in a particular way, they, they're looking at that tilt and they're saying, okay, given this tilt, this is a better thing for me to do. Now, I just had a uh, poll come in with, uh, the question was in the last 100 years, has American justice improved, deteriorated, or provided around the same level of justice as in the last 100 years since 1920? 9% said improved, a whopping 55% uh, believe that it's deteriorated, and, and about 36% believe that, that it's about the same level of justice here in the United States. It's so difficult to answer that question. We made it difficult on purpose. Uh, yeah. but, but you have this sort of consciousness that the system really does need substantial uh, change. Uh, no question about it. No question about it. And I think, you know, I'd like to put this a little bit in the context of, of the other crisis that we are dealing with in the country right now, which is the, uh, the pandemic. Right. And, I think what's really, you know, what, what the lesson that, we've, that those of us who have been in my field have known about the disparity in society and the pervasive, uh, persistent uh, racism and implicit bias 
uh, is that it's, it's not just in the criminal system. It's the entire society. There, the, 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 the virus itself uh, does not kill people based on, uh, on, on what a person's race is. Uh, it's, an, it's an equal opportunity killer. But why is it that, you know, that it's having such a disparate impact uh, on certain communities? And that is a reflection of the fact that it's not just our criminal legal system that's flawed, our healthcare system, our economic system. And you know, I, the, the, the one thing I'd like to hope that this, we, we take out of what has been, I think, a pretty dark year is a, a renewed commitment uh, to fix the society and to, and to not just simply say, oh, this was, this was a bad episode, it was a bad apple for this, or it was an unusual disease. No, no, this is, we are seeing, we are reaping uh, the residue of policies that have failed over decades. So when, when we're talking about somebody who, who um, has, is going through this system, is facing these choices, is interacting with um, the, the people who are defending them, prosecuting them, uh, the attorneys, the judges who previously are often attorneys. Uh, we're also talking about primarily people who are disproportionately affected being of color, right? And being right. of a certain uh, socioeconomic uh, level. And everybody else is primarily white. Most attorneys in this country are white. Most lawmakers in this country are white. Most people who administer the, the whole system uh, is you have this kind of an apartheid um, sort of running through our, our system. How do we address that? Because we have so much historic imbalance in the system in terms of our education uh, system that, that produces attorneys. Um, how, do we, how do we start to deal with that? Uh, now, you know, you and I can, can be talking here and your members and everybody could be of goodwill, but we don't have the same lived experience as other people, how do we how do we incorporate that lived experience into the justice system in a more fundamental way? The question uh, requires more uh, intellect and uh, perception uh, than a criminal defense lawyer or an executive director of an association of criminal defense lawyers can provide. But you know, obviously, uh, my answer is no different than I think any other person with common sense. We have to equalize opportunity in this country. Um, it, 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 if you didn't have to uh, sacrifice your financial future to get an education, more people would be able to get an education. If people didn't have to uh, drop out of school to keep a roof on that, over their heads, uh, more people would, would stay in school and, and, and come through. I mean, I, I am extremely heartened uh, by the huge numbers of people, uh, though percentage-wise it's not great, uh, who have broken these barriers. I mean, you can't, I mean, Honestly speaking, uh, it has improved over the last 30 years. Okay, we have, uh, we have many more people of color in the Congresses and the legislatures uh, in prominent positions in the legal profession. Uh, but we, we, we have a long, long way to go. And, you know, Mark, the only thing I can say is it's gotta be opportunity. I mean, in a small way, one of the things that we have done for the, a number of years at NACDL is we have a minority fellowship program where we underwrite we take, we give opportunities to people uh, of color uh, to be placed for a summer with a, uh, in a great defender office or with a great criminal defense lawyer, private lawyer, uh, or law firm, uh, and we and we cover their, you know, their their expenses, give them a stipend, and a surprising number of them then go on to 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 stay in the criminal defense function. Without that opportunity, that probably wouldn't happen. We have to do that on a huge scale. Um, if you look at the leadership of the large firms. They have way far to go. They're not. They're not. They're not putting people in positions of, of partnership. They're not recruiting. They're not. They're not elevating their own associates uh, in, into partnership positions. So um, it's a. It's a. It's a long-term problem. I could tick off all the ways that uh, my organization is trying to address it. Uh, we've now been doing an annual a program called Race Matters, in which we we confront the issue head-on, not only from the standpoint of highlighting that it exists but giving lawyers the tools to deal with it on behalf of their clients and bringing the client community into it so they can hear the voice, so that the lawyers can hear the voices of their own clients and be more attuned to these issues. But it's a, it's a, huge, it's a huge lift. And again, I say that you know, I'm old enough to have been through other periods of social unrest 
I hope this one uh, really advances the ball. I mean, we did get some great progress out of the sacrifices of people like John Lewis, uh, we were sadly reminded of with his passing. Uh, it led to some important legislation and changes, fundamental changes, really fundamental changes. We now have to go the next step. We have to get to where we, where we were promised we would get to by the, by the, the beautiful words of, our, of the founders of this country, but not necessarily by their deeds. I think it all comes down to we have to be talking about these issues and we have to reach some sort of consensus in the country that together all of us, all parts of this uh, justice system uh, need to fundamentally change. When we have the Attorney General of the United States basically saying there is no such thing as systemic racism in our justice system, it's a problem. It's a problem. That, that really does need to be engaged. And there are others who believe that as well. Although the evidence just look, I mean, just, just the numbers, just the, the statistics uh, indicate something else. You know, when it walks and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. In, in New York City for years, there was a policy of stop and frisk. It was, it was it, it empirically demonstrated beyond a doubt that it was, it was, it was a, a racially animated program. And uh, that's, those are the facts. And you can, you know, as, as has been said a lot in the last few years, facts are facts, they don't go away. You can't wish them away. You can't, by saying that it doesn't happen, it doesn't exist, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, it exists. And then when you go into the incarceration systems, you actually see those, those disparities, um, as you had said, as you began this interview, it just comes into sharp focus. We just uh, completed a poll and, and the results are very interesting. We asked, does incarceration improve public safety? Because that is the only reason to create an incarceration system, is to improve public safety. We have no yeses. We have a few noes that it does not improve public safety. Is safety. And 85% of the people who have said uh, it sometimes improves public safety. So the real question here is, if it only sometimes improves uh, public safety, are there other uh, approaches uh, that would not involve incarceration, that could improve public safety beyond taking people and moving them into uh, behind brick walls and shutting off, shutting down their lives. What is your organization's view of that type of an issue? Well, our, our, first of all, our view is that we are over, we are, we are over incarcerated. We, we, we should not be using jail, imprisonment as the punishment of first resort. It should be, it should be limited to dealing with those individuals who present an actual danger to society. And I would argue, and I think the statistics bear this out, that the overwhelming majority of people who are behind bars in this country, something like 2.2 million as we sit here right now, are not there because they are going to do something dangerous. They're gonna hurt anyone. They're there for a whole litany of criminal activity that has nothing to do with protecting public safety. Um, I, I have to use this opportunity to mention that uh, in a couple of months, uh, NACDL is partnering uh, with the Georgetown University Law Center and the American Criminal Law Review. Uh, we're doing a symposium on sentencing, uh, looking at, uh, at, at, at way, the way we approach it and how we could change it. Uh, and we're gonna be asking a lot of these questions. Indeed, we are gonna have uh, some panels of, from in, including people from Europe, where they take a very different approach. They've been experimenting, and we even have some prisons here in the in the states that are starting to look at the you know the idea that somehow putting somebody in a cage and making them live a miserable life for many years, un, untold years sometimes, untold numbers of years, is somehow going to make a better society is insane. It's 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 absolutely it, it empirically demonstrated that. The, even a couple of days in jail will lead to more negative consequences down the road. Uh, and it magnifies as you go through that. So I think the answer is we as a society, and if I could do one last big thing in my career, it would be to force society to say, why do we use jail as the first punishment? Why isn't that the last option? And this is not a conservative or a liberal issue. It's not a Republican or a Democratic issue. I've had interactions with people in the Koch Brother Network who are just as passionate about uh, changes. Sometimes the motivations are different. However, I think that we can all come to a consensus that what is happening right now in the United States, the cost in human lives, in, in, um, 
in, in terms of removing talent from um, access, in terms of financial costs, and in terms of, of its effectiveness, it's just not working. And, and everybody can get together on this. We can all come together and make changes. Norm Reimer, thank you so much for giving us a summary of, of, of your organization and, and what the organization is, is, is about. You wanna have the last word on this? No, thanks for having me. I, I, do, I, do, I will say this, this issue of criminal justice reform is an issue that is bringing left and right together. And I am, I am, that is one of the reasons why I have great hope that we will make great progress in, in, in reforming the system you know, over the next several years. Thank you very much for having me. Wonderful, thank you, Norm. Thank you all of our attendees for participating. Thank you for answering the, uh, the polls. That's the Nonprofit Report and we'll see you next Tuesday.